we feel privileged to have you back to this our show. I think that Kawhi's Human Humane Architecture happening to be our 297th show, and you are the accumulated viewer, which you're seeing down there. And we are back in the fellow windy city of Chicago, Illinois, and us is the Soto Brown back in his Austin Puff Design home at Diamond Head in Honolulu, Hawaii. You, DeSoto, are Bishop Museum historian and archivist. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, good day to you. Thank you, and me, Martin Despang, back at the opposite end of the world near Munich, Germany. And we meet, as I said, somewhere in the middle, uh, almost um, a stopover in Chicago that we're on to find out why we borrow uh, so much architecture from there. And Chicago is certainly one of the heyday places of architecture, the cradles of, um, you know, uh, urban architecture in the United States. But uh, that was then and now is now. And we're recently getting lots of high rises from architects from that city. So we thought we sent me back, which we did about a year ago, a little more than a year ago. And if we get the first slide up, we're also going, you know, uh, our minds go back and forth to other places here, cross references. That's what we want you, the audience, to do as well. One thing leads to another. And this is getting us uh, to capitals. And actually, we're missing on the, on the Illinois capital here. But we have a couple of other capitals. Which are they, DeSoto? Well, first, we're looking at a large photograph of the dome, the new dome or the new-ish dome, atop the German uh, legislative and government building, the main building in Berlin, which is called the Reichstag. And that goes back to the late 1800s, and it's been through some major changes. It was badly damaged twice, been renovated. And when, with the reunification of East Germany and West Germany after the fall of the USSR in the early 1990s, they did, they did this new dome atop the building, uh, which was to make things, to show that it was a new beginning when the capital moved back from its temporary location during the uh, splitting of the two Germanys in the city of Bonn. And so this is this uh, famous uh, dome, which I have not personally seen. It's a glass dome, and it's got this mirrored interior section to it. And you're able to, you do have to pay admission, as you explained to me, but you're able to look down on the legislative processes going on below. But um, we think that the Hawaii State Capitol, which was built in 1969, is better because you can as a member of the public, simply go up and look in the windows if you want to, or go inside to the galleries to see the uh, legislative processes going on. And so it's much more open to the real people. And we think that's admirable because the people are the ones who the government is running for, and the people are the ones who pay for the government. So the more openness and the more the architecture reflects that openness, better the process is for everybody involved. Exactly. And the picture at the bottom right is looking into one of the chambers of our state capital in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we do this because we are charged to write an architectural tour guide about Honolulu for DOM publishers. And so we better get going. And this is what I took when I was just happened to be there. And for this show here ongoing, we use their guide, uh, their Chicago guide, which was freshly out uh, a year ago. And so um, at the top right is what you mentioned, the Bonn one. And this is our friend Met Noblet's firm, Banish Architect, and in fact, the founder of the firm, Günther Banish, built that in the 80s. And again, in both projects that you see there, top right and bottom right, you can press your nose at the glass and pretty easily, um, you know, see what's going down there, what the ones that you elected are doing, hopefully what you wanted them to do. The one that we owe the picture to Semi, who took this for us, the picture of, to the left at the Reichstag. And it was what, uh, what Matt praises for good reason, the, the culture of architectural competitions, which we need more in America, which are not that common. It's more kind of invited competitions, if at all or direct com commissions, but Banish uh, rightly so prides itself of always challenging themselves in, in anonymous competitions. So they're not selected for their name. 
but for their best idea. And uh, so was uh, the Reichstag, um, you know, remodeling um, was a competition that Baron Foster, Lord Foster, previously Lord, now Baron, uh, won. And he did the best he can, again, to uh, sort of, um, I guess, the, I don't know how you want to call, the Nazify, because he, just before the show, you shared with me the horrid thing of DeSantis. You want to just quickly mention that? Well, just uh, something that's in the news today, this morning, right before we did the show, was that Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, who is in the running for president of the United States, even though the election is quite a long way from now, one of his staffers created a video and put it online, which ended with a symbol of that was used, an ancient Germanic symbol that was reused by the Nazis during the 1930s and 40s, which is called Sonnenrod. Is that correct, Sonnenrod? In any case... Mm -hmm. It's uh, and he used a symbol of he used this reused this symbol in a setting that was reminiscent of a Nazi rally and put Ron DeSantis right in the center of it. And so the Nazi symbols, even though they have been suppressed since the 1940s and are known for their evil associations, still show up to the amazement of me and millions of other people. Scary, scary. And uh, and of course, you know, the, the Reichstag played a role in Nazi era, and so it was a touchy subject, and Foster, you know, tried the best to denazify it, to democratize it again, and replace the stone dome by this glass dome here. And um, while it's quite spectacular, and, and thanks, Sammy, to having taken the equally spectacular picture here, uh, we see him down there in the show quote at the center in the middle with Jay, our founding uncle of Think Tech Hawaii at the um, annual um, uh, Christmas celebration and Governor Waihi. And so thanks, Sammy, for giving this to us when, you know, school, by the way, still, I mean, I was taught all over, all over that, you know, the Holocaust existed, so no one will deny it. So I know it. And Joey, my oldest son, who you know well, you know, had a Holocaust survivor come into high school, break out in tears, so he knows firsthand. But of course, the coming generations, you know, need to be reminded in different ways, right? And so um, we have to, you know, keep keep doing that. And and as far as the, the point, uh, the other point about, you know, watching your representatives, here, it's not quite as direct as in the other cases of Bonn and Honolulu, because as you see at the bottom, the, the chamber where the representatives work is actually uh, below under that second layer of glass on that sort of elevated ground floor, which is actually the roof of the building, but, you know, the ground of the dome. And you see there is a guardrail with illustrations on there, and that keeps people away. Uh, so they're more separated and more disconnected than in the other cases, which is a little bit of disappointing. Um, again, it, it is what it is, but... Um, yeah, but it also is a different world in that we need more security now. And when the yeah. Hawaii State Capitol opened in 1969, it was not as likely that there would be needs for security. Yeah. And yeah. that is something that is far more prevalent now that yeah. is very, and that's very important in architecture as well. And one of the things that we are very familiar with now is that government buildings are surrounded by uh, bollards or very deeply implanted protections so that you can't drive a vehicle up into them to blow it up. And you have to go through metal detectors and so forth. So it's a different world than it was when our state capital was built. Yeah, sadly so, but that's true, sad but true. Next slide, we owed another illustration of things we already talked about last time. But um, again, I was digging out pictures that I took in 2008 when I was there with our host, Dan Kubrick, who you see his pickup truck in the center picture. This is the uh, Crow Island School that we mentioned. That was the beginning of uh, the firm uh, Perkins. They were still called Wheeler and Will. Now they're just called Perkins and Will. Together with the Serenans, Father Aliel and uh, Son Errol. And there was a collaboration that they, they did. And uh, that actually made uh, uh, Perkins and Will become an expert in school design. And we read that they, after this build, 
the large amount of 500 schools because this was so it was so successful. It was an inspiration for us for our decarbonized uh, preschool that we see at the short board at the top center. Um, and we only knew it from, you know, literature. Uh, and then uh, when that was completed in 2008, I had the chance to see it. And in particular, the kind of broken up courtyardy, uh, you know, uh, um, sort of syntax of classrooms and outdoor spaces. The other inspiration was at the top right. This is a preview of our soon to be continued auto architecture show. And this is the solar hemicycle by um, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, officially called the Jacobs House Two, because of its passive solar uh, performance and, and southern exposure. So both projects were uh, were very informative for us. And it's amazing that's from 1940. Also reminded me a little bit of talking Osipov House that you are in. You also shared with us a couple shows ago the. The preschool, or I guess the kindergarten, right? Or was it elementary school that you went to at Punahou, which was also by Ofsipov, but is not an existing anymore, unfortunately. This one here still exists, and uh, you can read in the articles is just as fresh as um, as it was as it was back then. Um, I try to find out what the, it's a very sort of low profile one story building, but the entrance is marked by the slab. And there's some articles who basically say it's 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 just a markation for the entrance, and others basically say it's a chimney. Maybe it's both. And if it is, it's obviously you know a signal or a symbol for the fossil. While again, the work of these days should be a symbol of the post fossil. And I thought you particularly, amongst other things, I'm sure the sort of reminding you of your childhood in your uh, Osipov. But I also thought the ones at the top left. The ceramics you might like, right? Am I right? Yes, absolutely. And what it, what interests me is I'm seeing these touches that look very much like they're from the Dokomomo mid-century, 20th century period. The use of the stone, uh, the use of the ceramic tiles, and also that central sort of pylon that, as you just said, is either some kind of a, an architectural statement of a marking device or it's a chimney. But regardless, it is very typical of that post-war, post-World War II architecture. A lot of commercial buildings, even in Honolulu, used that same type of uh, element to make their buildings stand out, particularly for commercial buildings. You wanted people to be able to see you when they were driving by or looking for your building, and that's one way to, to make your building distinctive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so now we put pictures to the words of the Crow Island School. You know how that looks like. And it has to do with Chicago again, because it's up uh, the, the lake, Lake Michigan, um, in this uh, town called Winnetka in Illinois. So it's, it's up the coast of the lake. So drive up there and enjoy it. And it's not in the book, because again, the book is just Chicago, but we're kind of broadening the, the, the horizon here. Next slide um, is a, also a preview of how we close, but I put in show quotes at the top to illustrate the points that you made, uh, the solo rightly so, because we're looking at a double facade here uh, where um, we have um, basically an inner thermal threshold. It's triple pane glazed, likely. Then we have a cavity space, and then we have an outer uh, glass cavity, but we have at least, I mean, the yeah, first uh, illustrate your criticism again of, of similar situations in Honolulu with a uh, show quotes at the top. Yeah, we're talking about the gold bond building or the gold bond building as it has now, as it now looks after it was remodeled. It was originally a plain 1960s box pretty much with a facade that was the same on all four sides which in one sense is not that good because it's not taking any climatic uh, variations into account from the direction of the sun or the direction of the prevailing wind. But what they did to jazz it up and make it look more 21st century was to create an exterior sort of glass facade over a section of the existing facade. And all that does, particularly because the afternoon sun hits it, is create a pocket of air that's going to get a lot more hot heated up. 
And here in Honolulu, we don't need to be creating pockets of warm air to help insulate or keep people inside warm. Our problem is that we're often too warm inside. So in a cold climate, there can be a use for such an architectural element. But here in the Hawaiian Islands, unless, particularly if it's facing the sun, it is not only not of any use, it's actually detrimental because you have to be using more energy to cool your building because you've created a pocket of hot air within your structure, which you don't need. Absolutely. And that way, ironically, they wanted to make it look 21st century and they made it a form like early 20th century fossil where now you need to AC that more to be able to be livable inside. And they should have done what this building down there, which is by Perkins and Will, and it's a biomedical research center. They put the, the shading um, louvers, jealousies, that are retractable behind. And the reason or the, you know, the way to sell this to your client, because it's going to cost you, you know, twice as much because it's a double facade, so it doubles the cost. But it also minimizes the cost of maintenance for the very filigree and, you know, um, and, and delicate louvers who might be damaged by the wind and they can't if they're protected by the outer shell of glass. And that's how it's basically sold. And it's facing the, the lake is you see on that center picture on the right, you see this historic building in the center. This is facing the lake. The lake is east, so we know that this building in that picture on the left is facing south. And if it's facing south and the louvers are down, as you see in the detail to the left of that, it's good because it keeps the thermal threshold where the sun could get through and be converted into heat, keeps that sun out. While in the winter, you move the louvers up and you get, you get past the solar gain. And there's also vents in there that you see they're open. They have to ventilate it over the summer. So they actually, if you would want to do something like that, which we still say is a little bit like, okay, you wear a hat with a wind turbine on and thin film PV layer to run the fan that drags the heat, you know, out of your too much clothing. So it's a little around the corner. So you could do it easier and just be close, easy breezy. So we're not saying you should, but if you would want to do it, then that would be the way to do it. Uh, as to learn something. So here comes the shock that I warned you and the audience for, because um, the, until uh, a little, not that long ago, there was something else on that side. And that we see on the next uh, slide. And that's very shocking to you because you as a preservationist, you love to keep old stuff, especially good old stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, this here, uh, we talked about, you probably can figure who the architect is because that was sort of his signature style to go up against his mentor and master, Mies van der Rohe, who was the rectangular boxy guy. And there was Bertrand Goldberg who rebelled against his master and said, no, architecture needs to be organic. And which are the most iconic uh, twin towers of his that we already covered in a lot of times, these well, are the corn cobs, right? Yeah, they're the corn cobs, and that's the Marina City development that's uh, yeah. very famous in Chicago, which was created in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And they're very distinctive uh, cylindrical buildings with um, rounded lanais on them. So they really do stand out. And as you've pointed out, they were um, and still are a desirable place to live. So they've maintained a good reputation and, and desirability even for many decades after their construction. Yeah, and so had this building here because there aren't that many of Bertrand Goldberg and he's certainly an institution uh, in architecture in Chicago. Uh, I saw the building the last time, uh, the picture on the right in the middle as I labeled it here, 2010, I was there with my Prairie students. And I took a picture of it, that picture, not um, you know, having any idea that next time, took me 10 years to come back, shame on me, but it wasn't there anymore. It was replaced by the building that we just saw that in fact, they wanna even add onto it. And it would then look like in that little picture at the center of the top as a rendering. And interesting is uh, we have Jeannie Gang in Chicago, right? Uh, with her um, Pu'ula Tower. 
And she was, uh, and this is, uh, Michael, if you can get the bottom right, this is someone that Jay likes a lot, um, who is Mr. Uh, Mr. Kimmelman. And Mr. Kimmelman is an architectural critic, as we, I guess, take on the role to be that here in, in Honolulu. And he was uh, very critical about the plans to demolish that. And he reached out to Studio Gang, Jeannie Gang and her firm. And they made a proposal. And that was, I labeled it, I looked it up. That was in 2012. So when I took the picture and saw it, it was very timely to soon to be scrutinized. And they basically made this proposal to basically keep the building while still satisfying the needs of expanding. And they put this tower that looks very sort of scandalous and 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 uh, and um, almost uh, visionarily impossible. But they say they consulted engineers and they said there is enough structural integrity there that you could do that. And let's believe that. But obviously, um, you know, the clients didn't want to listen. Uh, this is an institutional client. We know this very well from our UH when we had told them a couple of times not to tear things down. It's just across architecture hall, which we will get to also either in this show or the other one with Matt. And they basically uh, knocked it down and built absolutely new one. This is rather sort of um, uh, bad these days because, you know, everywhere people getting increasingly aware of that we have to keep things in the life cycle. Whenever we can, we need to keep things. And only if we cannot, and I'm sure they had arguments, but again, Kimmelman and Studio Gang basically said, okay, we understand you need more spaces. You need more program. Here you are. So sh is that shocking enough for you, Isolde? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very unpleasant. And, and when you say we need to keep things, there are two reasons for that. The first being, from architectural standpoints, there are buildings which are never going to be replicated, that are never going to be designed that way or built that way again. And buildings like that need to be preserved simply because we need to keep our history and things that you'll never replicate. But secondly, every time you tear something down and build something new, you're using a lot more resources, you're using a lot more energy. If you can not do the whole demolition and rebuilding process, but make use of things which have already been through the construction process, you're benefiting way more than uh, starting from scratch and you're saving money too in many cases. Yeah, and why we threw in the show quote at the top right, which is the Royal Hawaiian Center, uh, that's why we do this on air every week for many, many years to raise, as Jay calls it, raise public awareness um, and to inform and educate clients slash owners of buildings because sometimes they don't even know what gems they have, right? Absolutely. And so, I mean, the Hawaiian Center is still there, but it's it's very, very altered. It's very cheesecake and tiffany uh, to a degree that you don't recognize, but it's luckily still there. And as we did the show about the Hermes store, that some people from the other side of the world, some French people saw that potential and basically retrofitted it back to its original tropical brutalist nature and you know added louvers and added vegetation did a really good job for that reason it's going to be in our book uh, and so we would encourage clients to to do that more and certainly again Kimmelman's and Jeannie's proposal um, you know, had had validity, and um, certainly, again, uh, that's why uh, you know the Royal Hawaiian Center is is brutalism. This is certainly brutalism, um, and you can, uh, you know, the point is one of the excuses is oh, it's not up to energy code. Well, you can bring it up to energy code. You can use you know vacuum insulation panels that you put on the inside of concrete. In fact, even, you know, in new buildings by Zaha Hadid, for example, in Wolfsburg, which is the headquarters of your favorite VWs, um, you know, she built a, a science center, the Faino, which is a new building that they basically used insulation on the inside to show off the, the beton brut on the outside, which is what, what, what's the other, so you know, let there not be excuses. This is what we basically say. Let's work with what one has. 
And uh, they call this uh, gray energy, by the way, the gray energy is, is the energy used in the whole life cycle in the circular economy and ecology of a building. And it's kind of absurd, you know, uh, when you have discussions with developers who say, oh, no, you know, to keep it would be too expensive. You know, how can this be? It's often an excuse and a lame excuse. Let's just go for the last remaining minute to the next slide, because if you build new, you get things like this here, which, again, we would say, hey, where is a double facade? There is only a single facade. And how is that going to perform, you know, in both winter and summer? And here they basically, I, I did the boat tour, I said at the beginning of the show sequence, right? And the very knowledgeable uh, guy basically had the, the intel here that he said, oh, this building prided itself to have something super cool that reminds us in, in Honolulu, they call this um, uh, ocean or seawater air conditioning. That's how they call it. Here they said it's river air conditioning. So they use the, 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 the walk, the temperature of the river to run it through the thermal mass of the building and then loop it. Well, in the river, it basically caused the fish to die and algae to grow because you were warming up. Uh, Hans Krock, the great partner of Alfred Yee that we did a show about, who is fostering OTEC, told me that in the ocean, it's not the case because the mass of the ocean is so huge that if you inject it back into the zone where the temperature, where the water already has that temperature, you can actually do that. I was skeptical about that, but when Hans tells me, you know, it works, I, I believe him. But here it didn't work out. Uh, they actually have to stop that. And since the whole thermal conditioning of the building is based on that, they're, they're pretty screwed, right? So here we go, right? You, you tear down a building like the one by Goldberg, and then you build something like this here, it doesn't really work that well. Oh, well, I guess. So um, <laughs> that's a, a kind of a sad and bad closing note, but it is because we're at the end of the show. So more to come and discuss uh, next time. You, however, will be uh, on air for the next three weeks with some interesting Momo shows that I and I'm sure you two look forward to. And until then, stay happy and healthy. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.